If you're ever driving down Highway 75 North from Atlanta to Chattanooga, you'll come across a small town in North Georgia called Ringgold. This is where I found Lieutenant Colonel Raymond Rowe, a World War II veteran pilot from the 8th Army Air Corps. He's the last surviving member of the Wendy Lou, a B-17 bomber that was shot down on his 16th mission over Germany. December 7th, 1941, do you remember yes, where you were? Yes, we were out in, uh, in Georgia. We live in Georgia now, and we were in the same county, always further towards Chattanooga. We were on our farm, and we heard the news. My father said, well, that means you're going. So you were waiting at that point to see whether you are going to be drafted or That's you were right. going to join. You yes. were going to wait to be drafted? Yes. Okay. And at some point, you became interested in being becoming a pilot. Well, my father asked me, Raymond, what do you want to be? What do you want to do in the Army? I want to fly, Dad. So he said, go to the level field and get your private license. So I went to level field and had a good instructor. I was soloing when the Army draft, uh, called me for, to be drafted. So uh, I went to the Air Force first and, and said I would rather be a pilot than uh, and walk in the infantry. They signed me up immediately and gave me 70 days leave. Then from there they sent me to Blytheville, Arkansas, where I had primary training. Like they say that a bumble bumblebee has too much weight for its wings, and this airplane had too much weight for its wings. So it was very difficult to fly. But it was winter time, and the air was very heavy, and I had no problems at all landing it. The instructor says, oh, you scared me when you land at low speed like that. I just, airplanes, I just felt, they felt me. It was a fit, it was a natural fit. Yes. So you, and you knew it at that point that you were meant to be a pilot. That's right. And, that, and that's why you were such a good one in, in, with the B-17. Right. We were at Tampa, Florida. They brought the, all of us young men together. Is this the first pod? You're the co-pod. There's a navigator and all. They introduced each other. And here's the airplane, the type of plane you're going to fly. You're going to fly this airplane overseas. So we all took our positions. Bombardier and I went to Chattanooga High School. We graduated together. So I had one man familiar. How many, how many guys were manning the guns? Six. There were ten of us. The ball turret, top gunner engineer, two waist gunners, ball turret operator under my position as a co-pilot, and a tail gunner. First mission in from England. Do you remember? That was a day of the. That was about three days after the invasion of France. My wife and people say, well, "What did they invade France for? Why didn't they invade Germany?" I said, Germany was on the other side of Paris, of France, and we had to go through France to get to Germany. Germans had already conquered France. So you took off on the eighth of June. Yes. Your first mission. The first mission. And it was over the Isle of Guernsey, which they had blue-skinned cows, I remember that. And they had one anti-aircraft gun, and somebody broke radio silence. First pilot of the lead plane were headed towards the Jersey Island, and they have a gun, they have anti-aircraft. Oh, they couldn't hit the side of a barn door on the inside. Did they open there up was, on you? There was one or two shots, and it hit that plane, and they went. They had to bail out. The guy that actually said that they couldn't hit the side of a barn. That's they right. They hit that plane. They hit the, the <laughs> lead plane. Whoever was in second command had to pull in. Well, instead of dropping bombs on a target that was holding up the whole invasion, we bombed about 200 yards on the other side because the navigator forgot to put his bombing site out of extended vision. 
he had extended vision, I remember that much. And then when he was getting ready to bomb, he would flip to another position, and then he would drop his bombs on that position. We dropped our bombs on the extended vision, which was out in somebody's barnyard or field. So that was a waste of energy. How many B-17s were on that mission with you? There was only about 10 or 12. 10 or 12. Yeah. You ended up completing 16 missions, or almost 16, 15 yes. and a half. Uh, were there any incidents in those other missions that you recall for some reason or another that made an impression on you? I really on recall you? one. We were flying towards our bombing mission, our bombing target, and we were just in formation with Bombay doors open and anti-aircraft shell bursting around us, and straight ahead of us, our airplane, we could see shells bursting. There were just about two or three shells bursting, and they're right at our altitude. And that's when I started praying. All I could say was, Dear God, Dear God, Dear God, by the time we got over the place where the shells had been bursting, they didn't fire anything. There were no shells coming up. So years later I realized the Germans had to reload their guns at that time. But at the time, you thought maybe your prayers were being answered. Yes. And well, maybe, maybe we, we didn't, didn't know what happened. I just say the Lord had, them change their, had to change their, so, add the new ammunition to their weapons. So maybe your prayers were answered. They were. People say, well, God, you're a co-pilot? No. I was a co-pilot. God had carried me. Mm. You'll pardon me, but... Sure. Well, let's talk about your last mission, the 16th mission. Uh, had you completed your bombing run when you encountered trouble? Had no, you it was right... It was, it was during the bombing mission. That's where the anti-aircraft fire was. That's the only time we had and the aircraft fire. I would look out and see, and look and see a little glow, a little red glow about like that, about 20 feet from me. Then black smoke, then you feel a shudder, and the metal from that shell was going through our airplane. The destination for your bombing run? That was Ludwigshaven. Ludwigshaven. Was that an ammunition dump, or what was it? Industrial city. There was manufacturing goods for the army and the service to fight us. Were you on target with the bombs? Do you remember? Yes, yes, we were. Okay. And where were you in the formation? Were you kind of in the front, the middle, the back? The lead plane was here, and we had to fly directly under it. Always look up. Can't look very long. Yeah. And we would fly like this all day. Anywhere from eight to nine to ten hours like that, following that plane. When did you first realize that you had been hit by a seriously that damaged was over, by flak? That was during the bombing run, naturally. During the bombing run. During the bombing run when the anti-aircraft fire was going. One of the, one of the engines on the right-hand side, a shell went through the oil radiator. Well, naturally, it started smoking, so I had to feather it. In other words, just change the props so that... Instead of being this way, it went that way, straight into the airstream. And then I increased the RPMs of the next one to it, that was the fourth engine, and it immediately blew up. Because when we flew overseas, we had a brand spanking new, bright, shiny, silver four-engine B-17 bomber. When we were arrived in the first mission, they, they showed us our airplane. It was a piece of junk. It was, had flown 25 missions, and the engines were worn out. 
So the second engine wasn't hit by flak, it just, when you ramped it up. It burned out, it burned out. When you ramped it up, So it then out. we had to drop formations, and we told everybody, all the crew members, to throw anything out that was moved, that they could. Uh, all the rifles, the ammunition, they tried to get the ball turret operator loose, they couldn't. But they threw anything that was movable away. And we were flying formation with two engines on one side, to the left side. And we were holding our altitude, maybe two or three thousand feet, I don't remember. Well, we better head for Paris over uh, the intercom of the airplane. And Bill Kaiser said, hi, hey, I've been to Paris, let's go to Brussels. We looked at each other and asked the crew, well, crew, what would you like to do? Well, we just assumed to go to Brussels. We didn't know that if you went to Brussels, you'd be interned in Brussels for the rest of the war. But if you went to Paris, you'd be flying again. Mm, you didn't See, realize we, we'd never told anything. We were just told just what to do and how to do it. So you, at that point, you thought that you were going to make it back? Yes. Well, we definitely knew that. We were on our way back. We were on our way to Brussels. But in the meantime, the navigational equipment that directed the navigator was moved from England to France that day. So there was no, it was only dead reckoning. In other words, just you had a radio compass. That's all you had to go by was a radio compass. We went over the Ruhr Valley and they did a lot of shooting, but we didn't get hurt. But then he said, hey, there's Brussels, there's the airfield. So we started circling around to land and they wouldn't, they kept shooting at us. We shot up flares and all and uh, that we were in trouble and all and they're still just shooting us up. So about okay. that time, the man behind me, the radio operator, a shell burst and killed him and he was right behind me. So all these shells hit him and then go through the airplane and hit me. So Bill Lee hollered, let's bail out. So he headed away from the airfield and we all bailed out. When they started shooting at you, you all had to be confused. That's why they were doing that. Yeah, we didn't know why they were shooting at us. Because you thought they were friendlies. They were friendly, yes. Yeah. So therefore we're going to bail out. We were under in friendly territory. So we all bailed out. Who, who went out first, do you remember? No, I was busy collecting my, tightening my gear and, and my parachute was between my legs. I had to pull it up and attach it. And when I looked around, the three officers were already out. So I started to walk down there and a little hole about that large round, I can't get through that hole. So I walked to the Bombay doors and there was one of the young men standing there. I said, Raymond Newton, why in the world don't you jump? You're an officer, you jump first. Okay, I'm not gonna wait on you, so I bailed out. He froze, and I did. Uh, I didn't know that until years later. The people- so He was afraid to jump. Whatever you, yes. Well, he just couldn't do anything, he froze. Okay, so you went out the, the Bombay door. Right. And- when I landed, the wind. Well, you had to pull the you had to pull the cord, right? Yes, and I forgot to tie my uh, strap my helmet on, and forgot to take my sunglasses off, so I lost sunglasses and a helmet. Okay, and how long were you in the air floating down? Oh, about three or four minutes. The airplane was on automatic pilot, but something happened to it. It made a circle and headed towards me. And I thought, oh, it's going to hit me. But then it kept swerving, and I watched it crash. Did it explode? or? It didn't explode, it just crashed. Just crashed. And then I didn't even see it burning, because by that time I hit the ground. Uh, did you have a hard landing, soft landing? What I had landing? a very hard landing because the wind was blowing. And I tried to spill the chute by pulling the rip cords, and I couldn't do it. So I reached in, I had a hunting knife here I carried. I pulled it out and cut the shroud line. I took my parachute and found a stack of hay and I buried it in there and then started walking off. I didn't know which way to go. Where were you? Was it a field or what was it? It was a field, open field, nothing in it. It was winter time, 
or late fall. And it was like what part of the day? What time of the day? About noon, three o'clock, something like that. Okay, and you started walking? Yeah, I started walking. A young man, a teenager with a big rifle, came up. Well, he said, why do you bomb women and children? We bombed the factories that made war supplies. It was the English that bombed the cities the population. because Hitler wanted to bomb London to destroy the morale of the English people so that they would capitulate. Well, the English were for the yeah. That's the reason they bombed the, the cities. Yeah. Where did the young, young teenager take you to? Just a little small one-room jail. There was just a little country jail with two old men older than were about my age, I imagine, but they were white-headed, and, and they, I reached in there and had a little small sniffer for my nose, and I reached one and picked up one of those, and they turned white. They thought it was a weapon. <laughs> well, you did have a weapon on you, though, didn't you? No, I had a twenty-five automatic, but I gave that to the young man. You gave that to the young man, okay. When he, you got when you. he captured me. Yeah. Okay. But on the way to the interrogation, we were in a, a Volkswagen mm -hmm. with about two or three men, two men, both of them had what they called burp guns. All of a sudden, one of them said, lightning! Well, we had to jump out and get under a tree. It was a P-38. That they called them lightnings. It was strafing anything on the road. But it missed you guys, obviously. Well, they didn't shoot at us. Oh, they said we were under a tree. Yeah, I, I got you. So then you went on to the wherever the interrogation yeah, was going to take They took place. us to an interrogation station. They wanted to find out as much as information as what they could. I told them, look, I just graduated from high school. I don't know what's going on. They showed me how to fly an airplane. Well, where did they do with the bomb site? I don't know. I was just a pilot. The bombardier had the bomb, bomb site, and they finally just gave up on me because I, I really didn't know anything. So at that point, they took you to a POW camp? Right, to Stalin 3B, which is near Sagan. Uh, somehow I met up with my bombardier, Bill Stewart, and the two of us were put in cottages that have beds in them, has a a stove in it, has a heater in it, the Germans furnished heat there, because they were English pilots that were, had escaped. They were the leaders of an escape that was very famous in World War II because so many of them escaped, but all of them were captured. Recaptured. Well, they put these Englishmen in these beautiful little cottages so that they could control them and there wasn't any way they could get underneath and bury a hole in the ground and Stay go out again. another tunnel. Then one night, evening rather, a group of German soldiers came in with pick and shovels. Ooh, we thought, well, here we go, they're going to bury us. They bought a hundred by a hundred by a hundred square ditch and threw dirt over the backside, went over to a fire hydrant, turned water on, froze over, and the next day we ice skated. Well, they, that's not, that was above and beyond the Geneva Convention. Why were they treating you so, so well? Because you were officers? Pilots? Yes. We were one of the German Air Force. Well, Luftwaffe. the Luftwaffe, I guess. Yeah, uh, they're, okay. they're, they're all officers. So they had a certain amount of respect for that's right. pilots. Yeah. Okay. And like I say, these were the Englishmen that had escaped and they wanted to have them comfortable, so they didn't want to escape. I understand. I understand. So we had to move out. We started out in the first, well, it wasn't but very long, that one of the German guards, he was very elderly. He was so weak that he couldn't carry his gun. So I said, hey, I'll carry your gun for you. We didn't want the German civilians or any of the military to come in there and kill us because they would have if we had didn't have any protection. So I carried the gun, and then, the weapon I should say, and as soon as some somebody looked German, I'd give the gun back to the German, and he'd hold on to it for a while. So they were your protectors from the angry civilian population? Angry for civilians, right. Yeah, okay. We were 
in a four-story barn. So I grabbed a handful of hay and went over and found a place that looked was real warm. It was warm, nice and warm, comfortable. So I threw the straw down and put half my blanket down, threw the other half over me, and I slept warm that night. The uh, next morning, I sat sniffing, and I looked down, I was a manure pile. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it was so warm. <laughs> uh, the, well, that's the reason I was so warm. But what, we'd been there for about three, two or three months. We'd, the, we smelled all the same anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> New, a different odor didn't hurt anybody. No, hurt. So then you finally did get onto your POW camp. Yes, eventually. down to Mooseburg. It was near Regensburg. Yeah. How long were you in that prisoner of war camp? A total of, this was only a month, two months. The total was six months altogether. Oh, six months. Which army or commander general liberated you? Oh, George Patton. George Patton. George Patton, the one that carried the pistols. Yeah. Did they take you someplace, or how did they liberate you? What was the well, they, process? They had open bed trucks. We all had to sit on the floors or stand. And they said, for goodness sake, do not stretch your legs over the tailgate. We drive so close together, we've had people lose their legs that way. We hadn't gone 15 minutes when we heard screams. Two Canadians had put their legs down in the truck behind them. So they crushed, them. They crushed their legs. Crushed their legs. Goodness. Ugh. Then they went through all that hell in the POW camp yeah. just to lose their legs. Ugh. Horrible. Ugh. When I was liberated, I went up to the to the gate and said, "Hey, buddy, I want to tour Germany." Now we were still at war, and the German we were in Germany. Mm -hmm. I don't want to tour Germany. He says, Raymond Rowe. I said, Charles Comer? We were neighbors. We grew up together. Wow. He said, go down to the river down there and tell them who you are and who I am that you want vehicle. So Bill Stewart and I went down there. We picked up a pickup truck, and we started down the Audubon, just like our freeways, and got held up by MPs. And they said, sir? What in the living blankety blank are you doing on this Autobahn? Oh, we're touring Germany. It's mine! What's a mine? <laughs> we know what, that, what a mine was. So obviously you didn't hit any mines. You they, to hear the and they said, how are you going to get back? We're going to turn around and run the same route. We came the same lane. Oh no, you're going with us. So we went with them to his commander, and he was thrilled to death to see two POWs. And he whined and dined us and, and I ate a piece of bread that tasted like cake. That was the first good meal we'd had. So then you are you, you when did you arrive back in like May of well, they, 45? For some reason we had some American troops who were going down to South America. So we went all the way down to South America. And we had bananas and good fruit, food like that and came back and when I walked in the house they looked at me like their mouth open. Where in the world have you been? You're supposed to have been at war. How'd you get so beautiful? I had a warm, warm suntan, <laughs> been on the, on the ship out in the sun for two weeks. <laughs> they thought I was going to be crippled and there I was full of health. And, so you celebrated a little bit I would imagine. Yes we celebrated. Oh, yes. That was wonderful. Well you had to be proud that you had served your country in. No, we weren't proud. We just did a job. We had to do it. And we just did what we were supposed to do.